Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The purpose of this videotape is to demonstrate what you are to do with the extracted teeth in the Profi 647 laboratory session on scaling, root planing, and polishing of extracted teeth with calculus. The techniques and criteria for adequate root surface preparation, which are demonstrated in this exercise, are also applicable to the clinical situation of treating patients with periodontitis. It is hoped that the direct visualization of the root surface possible in the laboratory exercise situation will facilitate your learning and performance of the task when clinically working with patients. In the Dappen dish that you received, there were three teeth. One is a multi-rooted molar tooth with calculus, a single-rooted tooth with calculus, and also one which has an arrow on the crown. The arrow is to indicate an area that has been sample root planed. We will examine that area, or we'll examine that part of the tooth first. Take your periodontal probe, and with the tip of the periodontal probe, run it over the enamel of the tooth first. And notice how the tip of the periodontal probe slides across the enamel smoothly. Now run the periodontal probe down onto the root surface where there is calculus on the tooth, and notice how the progress is halted in irregular with the calculus, which is uh, apparently coming off a little bit too easily here. It won't do that in the clinical situation. Now with the periodontal probe, then go over to the area that has been root planed and slide down it with the tip of the periodontal probe. And you'll notice it should feel smooth, essentially as does the enamel of the tooth. The smoothness of enamel is the only criteria, not proven yet, but the only criteria that we have to go on in terms of how smooth we want the root surface. Originally, the gingival crevice tissues were against enamel. They were not originally against a roughened root surface. A note about using the periodontal probe, too, might be mentioned here. When you use the periodontal probe, run it in the long axis of the probe itself. The periodontal probe is not used to its full effectiveness sideways, which should be used and run straight down the root surface of the tooth. We'll see that sometimes, as the probe slides down, you can actually hear the noise associated with it encountering calculus on the root surface. You'll be able to hear this or to, in a sense, feel it clinically. Now, besides the periodontal probe, we should also learn to use the number three and the number 17 explorer for feeling the root surface. The number 17 explorer is especially useful when feeling the CEJ areas of the teeth for roughness. It has a fine tip, but it is used with a coronal pull. When the instrument is used, 
the tip of the instrument only. The tip of the instrument should be slightly turned toward the tooth so that the side of the tip is what is in contact. A catching of the tip of the number 17 on the tooth is equatable with a nidus that will retain bacteria subgingively. Another instrument that you should use for tactically discriminating rough versus smooth root surfaces is the sharp edge of your periodontal curette. The fine edge of the periodontal curette essentially functions the same as the tip of the periodontal probe or of your number 17 or number 3 scalar. But it must be sharp in order to tactily give you information on the root surface. Now, when you are, you might first try and take and run the tip or run the side of the tip of the instrument across the enamel and notice how it glides smoothly. Then run this down on the root surface and you will notice that it catches when it comes to the calculus and the surface has an irregular feel to it. Clinically, when you are working, you take and you will move the tip subgingively and to simulate the subgingival situation, you can lightly cover the tooth surface with your finger. And then work below, you see how I can, then work below your finger so you cannot actually see it and therefore have to feel the surface. Indeed, while you are working subgingively in the mouth, you are working blind. But we will observe here for these purposes now. But you run the tip, the side near the tip, down to the bottom of the pocket. And where the bottom of the pocket is, you will be able to get below the calculus. How much pressure to apply apically is comparable to the amount that you would use pushing against your soft tissue here. You feel the gentle resistance. While the pressure against the tissue is gentle in the apical exploratory stroke, it is also, for feeling the root surface, it should be gentle. Now when using the sharp edge of a curette to feel the root surface, you should have a low angle between the face of the curette and the surface of the root of the tooth. This angle should be preferably below 45 degrees as you go apically and you slide over the calculus and you get down to the bottom. Now once at the bottom of the pocket you can open up the angle to a 45 to 90, to, to 90 degree angle. And this allows the edge to better engage the surface of the root of the tooth. The angle toward 90 degrees is more useful when maximum efficiency is needed for engaging a tough piece of calculus. But for smoothing and planing, the angle more toward 45 degrees is preferable if possible because the instrument will drag along the surface of the root of the tooth better and will tend not to dig in as it will sometimes at 90 degrees. So 45 degrees if possible for root pointing. Now during the coronal working stroke a great deal of pressure needs to be applied against the surface of the tooth. The edge of the instrument must be maintained in adaptation to the tooth. And you go back and forth over the area. Your heavier pressure is during the coronal stroke. As you're going back down apically, you slacken the pressure some. The instrument need not actually leave the surface of the tooth. It can stay in contact. Now notice the chattering sound during the initial stages of root planing.
as you get the tooth smooth, the chattering sound will gradually diminish to the point where the instrument just glides almost silently back and forth on the root surface. You will be able to clinically hear and feel this difference. It is one criteria to use while you are actually root planing. The instrument gliding back and forth. Now you have to be sure though that your instrument edge is sharp because if you have a dull instrument edge it will also glide back and forth even though you have a rougher root surface. An angle below 45 degrees for root planing tends to burnish over deposits rather than actually remove them. So this is why the edge must be maintained. Let me remind you the area of the instrument to use is that near the tip, the side near the tip, good, excellent, right there, near the tip of the curette. Don't actually use, though, the very tip itself. If you use the very tip itself, it can gouge the root surface. You want to use the side near the tip. The side near the tip at all times. Now, we're going to discuss problem areas in root pointing now. One of the problem areas has to do with the cemento enamel junction area. We'll go to a multi-rooted tooth here, though this is applicable to all teeth. The cemento enamel junction area, because of its inherent roughness, tends to hold calculus more readily than does other root surface areas. And so this is an area that frequently afterwards you can still catch on, even though perhaps you have root planed down in other areas and cleaned the calculus off of the enamel. Recalcitrant roughness at the CEJ area can be treated in several ways. One way is with the periodontal files. Which can be used, the periodontal files are like a multitude of little cutting edges, can be used right at the CEJ areas. The periodontal files can also be used deep down on the root surfaces where it is difficult to get access with other instruments. For instance, in CEJ, not C, excuse me, not CEJ, but distal lingual areas on posterior teeth. After the periodontal file is used though, the root surface should be gone back over with a curette. because a curette tends to leave a smoother root surface than does a periodontal file. Other problem areas on teeth are furrows and furcations of molars. Virtually all molar teeth, or at least multi-rooted molar teeth, have an irregular area on the root surface that leads into the frication, or a bio or a trifurcation. And when scaling and root pointing this area, or in this general area, it is very easy to have the instrument bridge over a dip or a concavity. If you have the tip of the instrument over in that way, you may miss calculus that is right in the depth of the furcation area. We can switch to another tooth here. 
and come in close up on it. We'll notice this piece of calculus right into the furcation area here. This tooth may clinically have had an early furcation involvement, or such may have. And in order for the situation to get better, you have to remove the calculus into this furcation area. But if the instrument does not get in there, if the tip or near the tip does not get in there, then it will not be removed. Another problem can develop, though, because when you are working into the root surface area, the tip of the instrument may go to the opposite side and gouge in there. When you are not actually when gouge here while you are in the process of root planing on this one here, you may gouge over here. This can be treated by taking and turning using either the opposite instrument or changing the angle of your instrument such that it will fit into the furcation areas and not have a tip going directly into the root surface. You may also first root plane from one direction, then change your angle, change your angle of adaptation slightly to root frame from another angle. And this way, you tend to get a smoothing in of the surface without cutting channels into it. Nonetheless, it is difficult to clean into furcation areas on molar teeth. This is one of the reasons why teeth with furcation involvements clinically have a generally poor prognosis. Not only molars have furrows in the root surface, though, or irregular areas, but you may also find on the mesials of the maxillary first bicuspids, there is naturally quite commonly a furrow there, normally a furrow there. On the proximal surfaces of mandibular anterior teeth, there, there is commonly a furrow down the side of the mandibular anterior teeth. Clinically, when you are preparing a root surface, if your instrument tip does not get into that, you can leave calculus in the depth of the furrow area there. One way of working with this then clinically in the mouth is to turn the instrument over in these areas and use the tip apically, like this. Another tooth that has a furrow which is frequently exposed by periodontal disease is the mesials of the mandibular first molars. Just a few millimeters down from the CEJ, there is frequently a furrow in the root surface. This is not actually a first molar here, but you see the same situation on the first molar and also other molars sometimes. But this is commonly encountered. Now, if you will examine your teeth in your dissecting microscope after you have root planed them as smooth as you can with the periodontal curettes, 
you will see, as in some of the slides that I showed you, that there are still irregularities on the root surface, that which are produced by small irregularities in the edge of the curette or by the chatter or vibration of the instrument. Now, these irregularities can serve as a nidus for plaque retention. So, polishing of the root surfaces is an important further step to take clinically in root surface preparation. Now, polishing can be done on buccal lingual surfaces of the teeth with a rubber cup and pumice. On the proximal surfaces of the teeth, if the tooth is, has a round root, you can use tape, dental tape, for taping the interproximals with floss or with the paste in place. But if you have a concavity on the proximal surface, or if the proximal surface is, relatively speaking, flat, as it often is on teeth, mandibular anterior teeth, molar teeth, then the amount of pressure that dental tape will place against that surface or into the, for, into the furrow area is relatively minimal and you won't get very effective polishing in this area. So this is where the port polisher, which you all got in your kit this year, comes into play. The double-ended port polisher is a very handy instrument and it comes with wood points. You see there's a different angulation on each one which can be used clinically at different places in the mouth. The wood points are pressed into place and then can be used in the mouth with profi paste to pumice or polish the surfaces. Now, I'm holding this is not exactly comparable to the clinical situation. Clinically, it is sometimes quite useful to take and trim the wood point to a sharper to a sharper angle. This will allow the wood point to get closer access between the teeth. You may use this with profi paste. The easiest method is just to, after pumicing the teeth with a profi cup, just to leave the paste in place and go then to your dental tape or port polisher for additional smoothing of the root surface. The root surface should actually be rubbed back and forth numerous strokes with the port polisher and you should go from one proximal to the next proximal and from both the buccal and lingual sides of the teeth. This smoothing of the root surface will greatly facilitate oral hygiene control by the patient who is making his best efforts. After you have polished the root surfaces, then re-examine them in the dissecting microscope and note the difference in the surface character smoothness. Do both of the teeth, the samples, which I gave you, but uh, with teeth with calculus, but do not do the tooth surface which has the arrow on it. I would like to have that sample back untouched for use in, in the succeeding weeks of this course. When you have finished both of the teeth, then bring them back to, up to me to let me check the root surfaces. Thank you. 
You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.